with her phone through binoculars. Um, she says another person with Eric, she identified um, before lunch, she identified Todd Engel and Ricky Loveland as working together. She stated that they had pointed weapons at her. Um, mind you, if they're directly at the wash, pointing weapons at her would be north e or northwest of the position. Um, it's a very interesting position to be pointing weapons at. She talks about how they were scanning. Um, she says there was a person with black hat, who was Eric, that appeared to be working together because they were near. They had dark clothing, not sure about a gun. Working close by, and she was informed that they mimicked each other's movement. She was informed it was objected to because she can't talk about third-party people bringing stuff up. Um... She said she was concerned because she could not shoot back because there was innocent people that could be shot with her gunfire. Um, she's very emotional during all of this. She um, is crying at multiple times. It, it seemed to me to be real tears, although she converts back to a very uh, harsh and bitter attitude after that. Um, she then enters a video from her iPhone. This is a video of the BLM's exit from a vehicle that's going along. We've only before in the last trial seen video from the protester side of the caravan going out. This is a video coming from a BLM or Park Service person who is in the caravan leaving. I can tell you the one thing that I did see in the video is there was no guns pointed at the caravan. I know they had said this multiple times, talking about people lining the streets, um, pointing weapons at the BLM convoy. This is the first video we've seen from the convoy itself, and you could see the streets line. Like I said, there's middle fingers all over the place, but not a weapon pointed at them. Um, she claimed she was an act. She was in an active shooter experience where I believe she said she shot the person who had shot uh, um, civilians and then was in active shooting with police, and she said that this situation with the BLM was a worse situation because in her active shooter situation where she actually had to kill someone, murder someone. Um, she didn't say she killed him. She did say she shot him, shot, right? Oh, yeah, okay. So yeah. when she shot someone, she didn't say that they passed away. So um, when she actually shot them, she was responding to that. So it wasn't as scary or critical of a situation because this situation, the people were coming to her, so she felt more on the defense or that was a worse situation for her. I felt that was interesting because there's no shots fired here, but an active shooter situation where she actually had to shoot someone, there was. Um, in cross-examination, her story goes back and forth unbelievably. She says um, she can't recall any times the whole day is up in the air. She can't recall any time. She won't commit to any time. She won't commit to many answers in cross-examination. I would say hostile witness in cross-examination. She's trying to give them absolutely nothing, but in doing so, she pretty much perjured herself. Um, she said that people were screaming obscenities, that there were men with guns. Um, she was asked about when she saw Ricky and Todd on the bridge, um, if she saw Nevada Highway Patrol. She said multiple times that she didn't see Nevada Highway Patrol, that they weren't there when she was uh, when 
she saw the two of them pointing weapons at her from the bridge. But then when they start in cross-examination, all of a sudden it goes from, no, they weren't there to, I didn't notice them. Now, um, they brought up the video from the Nevada Highway Patrol. They brought up the fact that they were wearing bright green or bright yellow vests directing traffic, that the vehicles were right there. Um, she just continues on with her story that she did not see them. She doesn't know if it was before or after. Um, like we said before, Todd Engel for himself was videoed the entire duration of the event. And there's never a video where he's actually pointing a weapon. So I don't really know, like it pretty much perjured her. I know that the jury has seen that. They've seen that just recently. So they knew going into this that that actually wasn't depicted on the video. Um, they talked about the briefing the night before, the fact that she was up all night. This is the first time this has been brought up in this trial that she tried to get some sleep, maybe got a few hours, and this goes back and forth. Oh, I was trying to sleep. I had my earpiece in. It made it very difficult, but she was able to get a few hours is what she said. She met with the U.S. Attorney's Office three times and the FBI at the same time. Um, Marchese gets up to ask about how she drove from one area to the other. Um, there's immediately an objection when he asks about who the people were around her in that position and a sidebar, um, which was a, overruled and they had to move on. She goes to identify the spot where the guys um, who were pointing weapons were at. And this is not on the bridge. It's a bit further back. We're talking about Todd Engel and Ricky Loveland here. She has trouble marking the screen because it was not on the exact timestamp where the government had her mark the screen. So she marks the screen and then she's like, wait, hold on. I'm a little confused here. This is, and then the prosecution says, well, this isn't the exact same timestamp that we used. You need to mo move it back, what, it, what was it, 13 seconds? You need to move it, the video back 13 seconds so she can accurately mark the screen. And then when she accurately marks the screen, it's right on a spot. So to me, that shows that she was um, coached into this. She was shown where to mark. And when you don't have the picture at the exact same timestamp, she can't mark it appropriately. Um, then she says she saw the black hat in the crowd uh, at a high ready which she's stating with her arms in the courtroom that he had his gun up to his nose. Also, lots of video footage, nothing that shows that. Um, and, and that she saw this from her position. When asked about the time frame, she said about 20 seconds, and then he went out of view. They were asked about the MOAs again, um, and the black hat, white patch, did not mention facial hair or a body vest. Um, at this time, FBI agents on the prosecution side are staring at us intently, trying to intimidate us. Um, I've seen this happen, especially to me directly, all the time, but I'm going to start marking it, you know, trying to get time stamps of how long they're going to do this and bring it up because um, we're not going to be intimidated. Then we go to the jury questions. Um, at any time we, that you were on the scene, did you, did you see the men saying anything to you or your rangers? I, I don't know what men they were talking about, if they were talking about the gunmen or not, but she said her, she heard people say, F off, get the F out of here, you know, basically what, you know, the group was chanting to them. Did you hear anything from the people on the ground say anything to you? So to me, the first question was about the guys actually making threats. They were so far away, there was, that was not possible people on the ground were what she actually responded to the first question. Do park rangers have body armor? Yes. Um, do you carry any type of armor? She breaks down crying again. She says, after this issue, we were issued better body armor because the high powered um, rounds would have made it through the body armor that they were currently wearing. Then the next question, and this is all on the same, from the same person, do you carry more powerful um, arms in your vehicles? She talked about her AR-15 and 870 shotgun. The judge asked then if she was wearing the body armor, and it was yes. <clears throat> when you saw weapons pointed at you, did you report it to dispatch? No. Who, what type of law enforcement, if you have weapons pointed at your direction, if you're like, these people are pointing weapons at me, do you not report that to dis dispatch? 
Why wasn't the report filled out on the same day? She said she was in a stressful situation. They had to escape. And when they got back to the hotel room, they still weren't safe. They had to continue on. So she said for three, it, days. For three days, they were still not safe until she got back to actually making her report. And even then, uh, three days later, it still wasn't a full report because she was still shooken up. Being in the lower low wash, looking up at the North Highway, the position of the guns pointing down, did they look in the low ready position? Um, this was confusing because she wasn't in the low low uh, wash, but she did say yes, they did look at the low ready position. She could see Black Hat pointing at her fellow officers, she said. Can you see, could you see the finger on the trigger? She said no, it was from too far away, but she was assured that it was there, even though a few days ago in court, they went through all the pictures and it blew them all up and you could tell the finger was not on the trigger. What is the difference between camo on a regular day versus camo um, here? She said any day she, she runs into people cam um, in camo while they're hunting, she has to do this on a regular basis. But that's different because those people are using the camo in a hunting position, whereas these people are using camo, camo to hide. Do you think, uh, who do you think was the incident commander? She then says to the judge, well, or my incident commander or the incident commander of the event? And she said, your incident commander. She says, Don Miller was originally, but then he had to go, or... No, Ranger Johnson was originally, but then he had to go back, so it was Don Miller that day. They asked, were you in regular communication with the incident commander? She said yes, but she did say that she had to actually leave her position to go speak with him. She was asked if, uh, if she was told that Nevada Highway Patrol was in the area, and she could not remember. Once again, uh, being a hostile witness, not wanting to answer questions truthfully. Were you aware when you observed the man with long guns, Metro was there to support the BLM? She said yes. When you saw a black hat scanning the crowd, yeah. could he have been using his scope as binox? She went to say that it's a possibility, but being in a hunting position, she teaches hunter safety, that you absolutely never use your scope as binox because you do not point your weapon at something you are not ready to shoot at. What happened with Swanson at the last trial when he said that he used his binocs for over an hour, I, mean, I want to say multiple hours, using his scope as binocs, and that's his, that's his reasoning for why he was pointing weapons at the protesters. And here we have someone who's a hunter safety person come in and testify in this trial that you should never do that. I mean, it's a possibility, but anyone trained with weapons would know that you're never supposed to point your weapon in an unsafe direction. So that was a really good thing to come out in court today. Did the three guys with guns have scopes on their weapons? She said she couldn't see that. As soon as she saw long guns, all she could see was the end of the barrel. May, and what she's saying here is, is she's envisioning the end of the barrel as soon as she sees a long gun. So how can you take anything she's saying uh, credible if as soon as she sees a gun, she's immediately seeing the end of that barrel pointed at her? And she can't even tell if there's a scope or not. Uh, without long distance training and scopes, would it have been difficult to make the shot if you were the target? She immediately says that she couldn't have made the shot because there were so many people around. The judge has to correct her and say, if you were the target. Then she says, well, it doesn't matter if they could hit me. They could have hit another officer around me so they could make the shot, but it would have been impossible for me. Next question, how many women and children were in the wash? She said she could not give a direct number but one was was enough too many. one was too many one too many um how did you and your colleagues cal calm down the crowd that was screaming she said i don't know we did we just disengaged so once again here we have the blm not trying to de-escalate the situation at all but escalating the situation with their actions you indicated that two men were pointing weapons in your position what did you do she said she ducked Next, the government calls Officer Sean Cox. He is with the U.S. Park Police from Washington. He is with, uh, provides security for the ICP. He was supposed to be on the transport team providing security for the cattle transport. So in the front or the back, transporting the cattle. Um, his, set, his team set, uh, is made to deal with large groups. That's what they're designed for. 
Um, he did say that they're designed to deal with nonviolent groups. Like most of their gear has to do with nonviolent groups, like the pepper ball, the plastic shields, if people were throwing bottles or rocks at them, not actual weapons. Um, he did not see threatening in nature. Civilians started to yell at them. They could have thrown anything from the southbound bridge. Although nothing was thrown from the southbound bridge, it's a threat because something could have been thrown from the southbound bridge. They did not want to make contact. They were just trying to keep them out. They made that, that gate. They weren't going to talk to the protesters. They were just going to make sure that they stayed out. Um, he talks about men on the northbound bridge with weapons. I want to mention here that the courtroom has changed quite a bit. So here we have four defendants instead of six. We have four defendants with four lawyers. On the prosecution side, we have three prosecutors followed by one, what is it, nine people on the defense side. So there, I want to say there is five FBI agents and two court helpers that sit behind them. If you count the judge who's also working on the prosecution, that's 10 to 4. So here we've had them stack the jury against us. It's a 10 to 4 kind of situation inside the courtroom. Everything's done outside the jury's eyes. Uh, they've made a motion to stop anyone from talking about any BLM misconduct or aggressiveness from them. And we're not allowed to talk about the defendant's state of mind. I, I mean, at what point does it get to be overkill here? And do people actually stand up and be like, what is going on? You know, where is a fair trial? There is no such thing as a fair trial. I don't even believe it is possible. And Andrew, wasn't the first trial six weeks? Yes. Six weeks for six men, and now we're having eight to 12 weeks to four men? Yeah, so she's mentioning that the first trial was six weeks for six men, and this is eight to 12 for four, but I believe that's because the defense is going to be actually allowed to call witnesses this time. Most of those six weeks, I would say at least five and a half of those six weeks for, for the prosecution, so hopefully the defense will get a little more time. Uh, Tanasi on cross-examination talked about these people. He picked these people out because they had the high ground, because they had guns and because they were wearing vests. Nothing that they were doing, it was how they were dressed. They were, they were picked out of this crowd because of where they were and how they were dressed. This goes back once again to you are being profiled and you are being charged for a thought crime, for what they think you could do, what that crime that they think you're going to commit. Here we have a situation where the situation went full uh, bloat. It, it went all the way through from beginning to end. No violence happened, no shots fired, but they are still prosecuting based on crimes that they thought you might commit. Um, so here we have, once again, no victim, no crime. Who's the victim here? These people were doing their job, a job that they signed up to do. Um, they were following or orders. There were no shots fired. And, and yet here we are in the courtroom um, being railroaded. They were talking about the Gold Butte, the fact that it was being reopened, um, the fact that... Uh, and, and he tries to go back and forth with this. Well, I don't know what I was exactly told. Well, I wasn't told that. I was here to transport the cattle. So once again, what we're seeing is either inside they're lying and they're keeping, they're preventing information, or our government works in such a way that they keep everyone from knowing what everyone else is doing. Because if the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, the government can get away with things without the little peons knowing what's going on. And they will have people... Um, executing unlawful orders because they don't know that they're unlawful orders. So what, what's going on inside? Is this gentleman lying to the jury and lying to us under oath? That's another thing is, you know, we heard the oath quite a few times. Do you, do you promise to, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? But the whole truth is not allowed up in the courtroom. Even if they are telling truth, it's not the whole truth. So that's a lie. That's a facade and it's a lie and it's meant to, uh, distract the jury and make them think they're getting the truth. Um, Leventhal got up and talked about the two vulnerable areas. They uh, initialized these two vulnerable areas as being the 15 because it had the higher ground and under the wash because it was a egress and ingress. Um, and that was picked out before anyone had even gotten there. Then they talk about all the gear 
the, the park police bring with them long guns, rifles, less than lethal force, pepper ball, tasers, helmets, um, shirts, vests, uh, visors, goggles, all that kind of stuff. They bring up a picture, point out the people, and now these set team members, they look like they are in war. They are in full green from head to toe. You can't even see their faces. You can't even decipher who they are. They look like mass um, like mercenaries. mercenaries, basically. Hired mercenaries is what they look like. And they are um, using these people on citizens. Do you send uh, mercenaries, people who look like mercenaries, out to deal with crowd control? Why would you do that? Would that not escalate a situation? I'm sorry, but if you're in a giant crowd and some guy comes up, you can't even identify him. He's head to toe in green and you can't even see, you can maybe see his eyes. I think that that would immediately put me on alert. So I'm not sure um, if that's normally what they're wearing when they go to these crowd controls or if they were specially outfitted for this alone to escalate the situation and had no, way, uh, no thoughts or even concern to de-escalate the situation, which is what every single one of those officers has testified inside today. Um, I'm going to go around, you know, we've got some new people here today. I was going to bring uh, Donna Hammond in to see how what she thought of today. Come on over. Thanks, Andrea. Hey, I was really excited to be here. <laughs> um, but I wanted to kind of fill in one question I think that um, was important that you missed that the jury had asked. Um, they asked the BLM officer, gal, Alexandra Burke. Yes. Why did you move closer to get photos if you felt so scared? <laughs> exactly. Great question. And I don't, I don't think she answered it. I, I didn't write down an answer, but... Um, well, it wasn't clear. Yeah, I think they let her pass. Uh, her no, she her. actually did answer. She said, well, at that moment, she wasn't in pure danger and that there were two people already at that life post that had weapons to cover her, so she felt like she could go up and do that. So what do you think, I, I know that you had experienced the Portland trials, uh, what do you think versus this trial versus the Portland trials? Well, first of all, recognizing that they're allowing the, the jurors to ask questions, I was shocked and yet pleased because they are asking questions that obviously the defense doesn't get to. Now, the, the two, que two questions that came up that Navarro wouldn't answer <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, if they don't catch that um, in their hearts as a problem, they're not paying attention. But when they ask, is it not, so more or less, is it not legal in Nevada to open carry? And she declined to answer that or have anybody else answer that on account it would take a couple of days to decipher for you and give you all the if this, if that. You know, well, maybe and little scenarios to help explain it. The law isn't that hard. <laughs> well, she also threw in there, but I can guarantee you all that these gentlemen are not being charged with merely open carrying mm -hmm. in public. But so, that, so she really did try to like backhanded do that to the jury. But and I'm yet, sure they the did. The whole catch thing it. is about the guns, the gunmen, and if it's legal in Nevada to open carry long gun too then what are we here for? Because that's that's what everything is pointed at, the guns. And oh, it made me scared. And thought crimes, what yes. you could have done with the guns, even can, though they didn't do it. Their imagination is running amok. Exactly. For being trained um, federal officers with 15, 20 years experience, they shouldn't be afraid. They should not go into immediate, I was afraid for my life. <laughs> And, and, and crying they, off and on. She yes. was really quite an actor because she got after she was and... done crying, she would go to this bitter, stern um, attitude. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She. Yeah. She was uh, not very credible after watching that whole show. <laughs> So what do you think? Do you think uh, Portland was more uh, Portland's judge was more biased, or our judge up there was more biased? Well, that's a tough one. They both are. They both are. It's it's quite <laughs> obvious, and you actually have to come and experience this to see the bias, um, because you're not going to get it except from Andrea or one of the rest of us standing around. But when you actually witness it, it's highly disgusting. It makes you want to just spit. 
totally different. So once again, there there you go. It's not a, a case problem. It's a judicial system problem. This is something that is happening not just here, not just in Portland, all around the United States. Our justice system is broken. Truth is not allowed in the courtroom. If they want you in prison because the private prison, uh, they're making money off of our children, they're making money off of our people. If they want you in prison, that they're going to do it. And if it takes keeping the truth out of the courtroom, that's what they're going to do. They're going to stack everything against you, and it's not a single problem. It's not a one-case thing. It's, it's a, our whole judicial system. If, you, if a judge can be appointed and is there forever, that's an issue. Just like law enforcement, just like we want our law enforcement to be held to the same rules and regulations we are, we want our judges to be held to a higher standard as well. They should have to uh, adhere for any mistakes that they make because people's lives are on the line when they make a mistake. Just like law enforcement, people's lives are on the line when they make a mistake. Well, thank you for coming. Thank Are you going to be here tomorrow, too? I will. Be All here. right. Well, thank you for coming down. Does anyone else want to come on and, and say what they thought today? Yeah, come say hello. Come say hello, you guys. Hey, I want to say something about what you said about right, the judiciary, on. Andrea. You know, I, I'd like to encourage everyone to go to YouTube and look up a show called, called Lawn Jeans Chronoscope. I mean, it, it's, it was by the Lawn Jeans Watchmakers in 1952, and I believe the one you can look up will say... Um, Congressman Keating, before the Keating, you know, the savings and loan scandal. And this is a great interview because what they say to this man, this is a, a news program, kind of, it was conservative for them, but they weren't really conservatives. It was just 1952, everyone looked conservative. And and they said to this man, he was um, on the judicial uh, subcommittee overseeing the Department of Justice. And they said, isn't it true that if a totalitarian regime was to get a foothold, that they would first need to take over the Department of Justice? And he said, yes, and the police, because they have to be able to control the interior. And then they back up and say, well, I'm not saying that's what's happening. And they smile. But then they go back and say, but that's exactly what they would need to happen. And that's what we've already seen has already happened. It's already done and over, people. What's going on upstairs uh, and what I've seen since I've gotten on here and what I've heard from many people that have come down here and, and told their stories, it's happening. It's happening all over the United States. Our judicial system is broken. It needs a full one over. This is not something that's a quick fix. This is something where we need to start holding these people accountable for the injustices they are doing in our country. Um, I think that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, once again, Greg Burleson is getting sentenced tomorrow morning at 8 in the morning. Court for us doesn't start till 1030. So we will have Greg Burleson sentencing going on in the morning. Um, we've got a, a good crowd, a bunch of people that have come from all over the place, you know, Oregon. We have people from South Dakota even um, come to watch the injustice and, and support our people inside. So we've got Greg Burleson sentencing tomorrow morning, and then we will start at 1030. So we may um, may do a quick update after Greg Burleson and not do a lunch update um, because we won't be in there very long. We'll just have to see how it goes. Um, all right, thanks everyone. And remember, no victim, no crime. Let's get this uh, tweeted out there, hashtag no victim, no crime.